Boston had its strangler. California had the Zodiac Killer. And in the depths of the Great Depression, Cleveland had the mad butcher of Kingsbury Run. Over the period of four years, 13 bodies would be scattered across the city. Dismembered bodies with surgical precision drained completely of their blood. Terror gripped the city. Amid the growing uproar, Cleveland's besieged mayor turned to his newly appointed director of public safety, Elliot Ness. Ness had come to Cleveland fresh from his headline-grabbing exploits in Chicago, where he and his band of untouchables led the frontline assault on Al Capone's bootlegging empire. Now, he would confront a case that would redefine his storied career. How did America's Ripper hide in plain sight? Our guest, author Daniel Stashauer, takes us into the crimes as only he can. Then later, we revisit the supernatural aspects of this story, as covered in The Holzer Files, Season 2, Episode 1, The Phantom Hand, where myself, Cindy Case, and Shane Pittman revisited the sites of some of these murders in the hope of putting restless souls to peace. Sabrina Marie and Teresa Muncie join us to talk about the paranormal in and around the city that ties to these devastating deaths. Plus, a brand new paratune, This Land is Cursed by Dan Doherty. All that next on the Paranormal 60 with Dave Schrader. I'm not gonna stand here and listen to this baloney. He won't know. He doesn't stand for baloney. Supernatural baloney to me. Supernatural, perhaps. Baloney, perhaps not. Good evening, my little darklings, and thank you again for joining us here on the Paranormal 60. And let me remind you, we are coming into the end of the Ghosts of Devil's Perch. New episodes every Sunday only on Travel Channel and Discovery Plus, but the end is near. Join me tomorrow my special guests as we recap the most recent episode and give you a sneak peek of what you can expect next week. That's coming up tomorrow right here on the Best in Paranormal Podcasting. This is the Paranormal 60. Our guest this evening is joining us to discuss another element of a case that really fascinated me. For those of you that have followed my journey, you saw when I did an episode of The Holzer Files in season two, It was the first episode. As a matter of fact, I think it was the third one we filmed, but it was so crazy with activity in the history and the mystery surrounding it so powerful that it became the first episode out, The Phantom Hand, as we talked about this, what they referred to in in some places, the torso killer, this brutal killing spree that would take place throughout Cleveland and uh, the Kingsbury Run area. I've been looking for a guest to discuss this for the longest time. And thankfully, as of just a a few weeks ago, a brand new book came out and it's available now, American Demon, Elliot Ness and the Hunt for America's Jack the Ripper. Daniel Stashauer is my guest for the beginning of tonight's show to discuss this crime. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Great to be here, Dave. What a bizarre story. I mean, again, the way we were brought into it through Hans Holzer's old case files uh, to come in and and investigate these strange claims and to kind of uncover a a brutal set of serial killings that took place that not many people knew about. I mean, when we aired that episode, Daniel, so many people that are into true crime were baffled by the fact that they had not heard about this before. How do you think this story has stayed under the radar? I know it captured the headlines across the nation for quite a while, but why is it kind of the silent forgotten set of murders? Well, it captured the headlines at the time and it has been written about. There've been uh, a number of very excellent uh, uh, studies and interpretations and, uh, and books written about it uh, over the years. Um, both at the time and, and, and subsequently, but for me, uh, the I came into it very early on. I gr- I grew up in Cleveland, mm-hmm. and uh, when I was eight or nine years old, uh, and I was at summer camp, we had an overnight, and we're and the counselors are telling ghost stories around a campfire, 
And one of the counselors hits on these murders as the subject. This would make a great story to tell a group of young campers around a right. wearing their s'mores around a campfire. Well, you can imagine. First of all, we had to stop and have him uh, explain to us what the word decapitated meant. Um, and I remembered, that, I remember that the, there were several repetitions of the phrase, the killer is still out there. Well, you can imagine the effect uh, that had. I don't Certainly. think I could have to wink that night. You didn't have to embellish a whole lot to turn this story into the stuff of nightmares. It was already there. Elliot Ness, obviously one of the most famous names in law enforcement, but uh, I was surprised when, when we were there looking into this case to find out that this, this case coming off of Al Capone and all that he had worked on with the Untouchables, this case really kind of stymied him and the law enforcement around that area. Maybe you could take us to the beginning of these murders and how they started to play out. Sure. Uh, this is this is the 1930s. It's at the worst of the Great Depression. And uh, the killing started even before uh, Elliot Ness came on the scene. It was a string of absolutely brutal, horrific crimes, a series of murders in which the victims had been beheaded, some of them, it appeared, while still alive. And then the remains uh, dismembered with surprising almost surgical skill in many mm. cases and the body parts scattered around the city where they were, were found some, some of them in the, in surprising and extremely disturbing ways. A pair of schoolboys would, uh, would trip over some remains or a severed limb would be spotted floating down the Cuyahoga river. In one instance, uh, a skull was found rattling around inside a tin can at a, at a city dump. Um, mm. As you can imagine, it touched off uh, a climate of fear, much like the Jack the Ripper crimes 50 years earlier. With all of these tragedies that are taking place, these deaths, would you say over a period of four years or 13 deaths associated with this, how do we know that it was the same killer and not just, you know, I mean, people kill, people do horrific things to one another. What made it so certain that this was one perpetrator that was carrying out this this activity an excellent that's an excellent question and it's a point that has been much debated both at the time and to this day it took a while before the police realized that they were dealing with a series of connected crimes it was, as you say bodies do turn up some mm -hmm. of them uh, quite brutally handled but at one stage a body was discovered barely a mile away from where two others had been found a few months earlier. And the scale of the thing snapped into place. Uh, an investigator told the press that he and his detectives were on the trail of a crazed killer with a flair for butchery. Over the course of the series of crimes, two different coroners were working on the problem and they were pretty confident that the same hand was at work in these killings. There were telltale signs of, uh, particularly in the dismemberment, that indicated a practiced hand and a consistency in the approach uh, that tagged the killer as, that it, as a single criminal rather than a series of unrelated crimes. But remember, this is the 1930s, modern forensics, still in the very early stages. So the police mm -hmm. had an uphill battle from the start. Yeah, I would guess so. And what was it like? Do you know the climate of that area? Uh, you know, Kingsbury run in the 1930s. Was it a, you know, Chicago had been a, a violent center of uh, treachery and, and bloodshed. What was Cleveland like at that, at that point? Well, it's it, Cleveland in many ways. Cleveland was uh, nearly as mobbed up as Chicago was uh, at the time. So violent crime was very much a problem uh, in Cleveland. And that's what brought Elliot Ness to the area in the first place. But Kingsbury Run, which had originally, which was a dried up uh, ancient riverbed running through the city uh, during the Depression, had become a focus of homeless uh, itinerant travelers, shanty towns. Uh, places where itinerant um, uh, dwellers and, and people looking for work uh, set up temporary housing and uh, 
and it was a particularly gloomy place. There was a, a, a contemporary account at the time, a, a newsman uh, took a photographer and went down in the middle of the night and he, and he wrote some words I'd like to quote to you because I, I find them remarkably spooky. He wrote, last night I went down in Kingsbury Run. Kingsbury Run, that lonely, mysterious gully where prowls a mad butcher. Four of his headless victims have been found here. He has killed others. There's an awful lot of territory in Kingsbury Run, territory, a great deal of it, that isn't even mapped and doesn't have so much as a footpath. I can testify that if you enjoy feeling your flesh creep, feeling the small hairs rise on your neck and your heart pound with shameless fear, if that's what you like, just take a midnight tour through Kingsbury Run. It might be best not to go alone. I didn't. And what's more, I never will. Yikes. Well, that's the kind of writing that you're getting right. on this series of crimes and around Kingsbury Run and, and in particular. You know, just for me, the little boy who heard the scary story around a campfire, stuff like that just uh, just gives me a chill. Right, and, and here it still does all these years later, right? I mean, almost 100 years between those crimes and just the, the thought of what was taking place. Was the focus on these shanty towns at first? Did they assume that it had to be one of these disenfranchised people that were were doing these murders or because of the precision were they looking at doctors much like they did in the jack the ripper cases the the precise nature of the dismemberments led the police to believe many of them to believe that the killer must be someone with some surgical training or skill a, a doctor of some kind a medical student the, or even a, a butcher someone for whom this kind of knife work um would would be uh, familiar and they would know how to navigate well, one of the corner coroners called the anatomical landmarks of the body as they were approached. Uh, it's an, ex it, it's an extraordinary thing to, to think of, of a, 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 a surgeon gone mad um, in this way. But the, the reason Kingsbury run became such a focus uh, of the investigation is that the killer appeared to be preying on the people who lived there people who would be hard to identify and people who wouldn't be missed. And that became a feature of the crime. And many of the victims never were identified. Wow. It, it makes you wonder, right? If these people are in such a way in, in dealing with such hardships, how easy would they have been to bait away with the promise of a meal or a few dollars just to get them away? And then not knowing what they were stepping up for, that would Absolutely. be the end of their life. Absolutely. These were desperate times. And it wouldn't have taken much to lure some of these victims to their dooms. And why I would guess many people believed it would have been the shantytown villagers because it was desperate times. And maybe you kill some of these people and take their money. But when you start to look at the other side and realize they're most likely, they're unidentified, nobody's claiming them. That means they're not a person of prominence in the neighborhood. That means they must then be part of this disenfranchised. There's nothing you're going to get from them of any value, uh, at least not monetarily. There might have been sexual gratification. Do they believe that there ever was any kind of violation done that way, or was it strictly just violence? There were a, a whole lot of different theories and different um, um, motivations put forward as possibilities um, for the crimes. Bear in mind that when a lot of this was written about in newspapers, mm -hmm. uh, it was very difficult to write about them and adhere to the standard of decorum um, uh, of the day. So when the police began to um, speculate that there was that the killer was deriving a form of sexual gratification from mm -hmm. these murders, it was a very difficult thing to write about in the newspapers of the time. Some of the victims. Uh, had been castrated and the newspapers really struggled for acceptable language to describe uh, that atrocity. One of the newspapers described uh, the, the uh, body as having been um, 
dismembered and otherwise mutilated. And you had mm -hmm. to read between the lines to figure right. out what was happening there. Did the killer seem to take pride in their work? Were they leaving clues behind to taunt Elliot Ness and his new enforcers to try to find this? Was there any of that? Or, or do you think this killer could have cared less who was looking into this case? They knew that they were going to keep getting away. There was a suspect that Elliot Ness and the uh, team that he put together to uh, investigate this kind of, kind of off the books, there was a suspect that they liked for the crimes. And uh, at the time and still today, there was a great deal of uh, controversy over whether this was the actual uh, killer or not. But this man, who was known um, initially as Dr. X, appeared to take a sort of perverse pleasure in the attention he was getting from Ness and his men. And it's said that he even uh, called into police headquarters. Uh, to comment on the poor quality of the surveillance effort that was being uh, carried out on him, and he even offered helpful hints about where he would mm. be the following day if Ness and his men wanted to try again. But the killer uh, didn't leave a lot of clues, and the newspapers commented on that all the time. They said they would say over and over again, "He le he leaves few, if any, clues," and the police were growing frustrated as the crimes mounted hmm. when these crimes are taking place to these type of people do you believe that there wasn't as much manpower truly put on it because sadly they weren't people of prominence there was other things to attend to at the time and they didn't want to a get their hands dirty or b perhaps put themselves in harm's way there was criticism to to that effect and certainly because of the nature of the victims that they were itinerants and uh, people who kind of were off the grid, I think the police were probably slow to, were, were slow to realize that this was a series of crimes. But although there was criticism, uh, uh, one commentator said something to the effect of, you know, if this had been a series of city councilmen found dismembered, you can right. you better believe the police would have, uh, uh, would really be shaking the branches. But from everything I've read and looked at in the papers and in records uh, that, are, that are available, it feels to me like the police uh, put forward an absolutely heroic effort, that they left no stone unturned. They put in all kinds of hours. They devoted extra uh, resources, manpower to the investigation. They were really giving it everything they had. The problem was we're at an early stage of forensics. Um, this kind of killer, it just, it baffled uh, conventional approaches, conventional wisdom. There was really nothing in the experience of uh, the men on the force to prepare them for this. But even so, the, the uh, scale of the uh, of the effort they put forward is extraordinary the coroner pulled together a team of experts including elliot ness to put together what they called a synthetic portrait of the killer trying to imagine what he would uh, what he would be like to, ch to check the boxes in his profile now today we recognize that uh, as as being criminal profiling they mm -hmm. were just pushing forward trying to push past the limits of the time and their resources Obviously, you know, your book takes things into a different way of looking at this case and, and the crimes. What did you like about Ness's perpetrator? What in, in what he was doing? What what felt right to you about well, I think, you know, I can understand why this seemed like the best path. Well, Dr. X, Ness's suspect, checked a lot of boxes. He was a disgraced physician and he had a substance abuse problem uh, mm -hmm. and there were a lot of uh, shady things going um go going on with him ness al remained um, alert to the possibility of other suspects but he spent a lot of time concentrating on this guy uh, they they weren't able to find anything to bring the guy to trial but ness believed that if they kept the pressure up um, they, they'd get there. He believed, uh, that this, that this was the guy, but a point that I always feel I have to, to make about Elliot Ness is in any other city, nobody would have called on him 
to, to get his hands on this, uh, on the details of this case. He's the director of public safety. The chief of police reports to Elliot Ness. Mm. Now, nobody expects that guy in any other city to get involved with a murder any more than they expect him to put out a house fire or rescue a cat stranded in a tree. He's the guy at the top. But Elliot Ness, being who he was, people did expect action from him. And right. Ness had led the people to expect. He had said, I'm not going to be uh, locked away in an office. I'm going to lead from the front lines. So as the scale of these crimes became apparent, as the investigation gathered force, Ness felt he had to step in. He said, I want to see this psycho caught. How many viable suspects were there really during this? I mean, obviously Ness had his Dr. X, but I like the fact that he didn't hone in on one so much that he might've missed others. How many do you think there were in total for true suspects? An extraordinary number. Uh, there was a detective um, at work on this case. His name was Peter Merlo. He may have been the most dedicated uh, policeman ever to put on a uniform. They brought in all kinds of people. Uh, mm. Some of them on very slender uh, um, pretexts, but right. they brought people in. They questioned them. Um, they and a, a lot of these um, were catch and release affairs. They'd they'd catch a guy, they'd uh, question him for a while, they'd let him back out, maybe keep an eye on him for a while. Mm -hmm. But it was very much a a cast a wide net, bring in as many people right. as possible turn over as many rocks as you can and see what uh, what comes out. The, the police uh, effort stretched out in a lot of directions and they knocked on a lot of doors. They really, really um, put themselves to uh, every conceivable effort. Uh, no, 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 uh, no lead wasn't chased up, particularly with uh, Detective Merlo and his partner. Did this did this murderer taunt them that they had interviewed him or had him in the sights? Or did he point out the fact all these people you're talking to, you still haven't gotten to the right one? Dr. X, Ness's mm -hmm. suspect, uh, sent some, some uh, letters and postcards that walked right up to the edge, but never crossed over the line into anything mm -hmm. that be construed as an admission of guilt but yes there was taunting and it must have been incredibly galling for ness and the men involved with these crimes um that the that um, the killer appeared to be thumbing his nose at them what what do you think led to the murderer stopping once and for all it's going to be debated uh, as long as people talk about crimes like this one, whether it was cause and effect. Uh, in Ness's uh, view, I suspect he felt that the pressure that they were putting on him um, basically ran him to ground and uh, he, he the, the crime stopped. Others felt the crimes had stopped already, but it was some time before the city could really let out a breath and uh, and admit to itself that the killings had in fact stopped and every so often something would turn up for many years afterwards either in cleveland or further afield that led people to wonder if the killer hadn't just moved on and picked up somewhere else right in in the investigation that we did on the tv show of, of course obviously none of us are law enforcement officials uh just going off of of the history, the purpose, and what was going on, it sure seemed like it might have had something to do with railway workers, um, somebody that could get in and out of town pretty quickly, pretty stealthily, and beyond. And there were actual stories that we were finding that showed that there would be murders here in this area in Cleveland, and then they would stop, and then 20 miles down the road, along that same stretch of railway, similar murders would take place. Detective Merlo, the, the, the officer I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. um, uh, embraced that theory for, for some considerable time. Uh, he, he, he believed exactly as he said, there was a series of crimes unfolding next door in Pennsylvania. Mm. And um, uh, Merlo and others believed um, quite reasonably that the killer 
would commit a crime, hop on a train, go elsewhere, maybe even do some of his butchery on the railroad car as it was moving from, from uh, place to place. But many of the bodies were found along railroad lines. And uh, it was natural to assume that the, that, uh, the railroad the, the, the railroad played some role, not only in the crimes themselves, but in keeping the killer, in helping the killer to avoid um, detection. Others disagree. Well, certainly that, if I could mention, that area would be, you know, immediately you'd think, to what end? Why would, if, if it didn't have something to do with somebody on the trains, trains make a lot of racket. There's a lot of noise, a lot of things. And if you brought that person down to that area as a train's coming through and committed the murder, that might help cover up a lot of the screams, uh, the the um, torture that was taking place. Do you think that that played part in, in his decisions of where this took place as well? Uh, there, were, there were many people who, uh, who thought so. It has to be pointed out that uh, both Cleveland and Pennsylvania were uh, were hubs of uh, railway um, right. transportation, so there were a whole lot of trains coming in and out, and that's part of the reason why there were so many uh, itinerant people uh, moving through um, the the city during the Great Depression. They came in, they came out on the the, the railroad. They're hopping uh, hopping freight trains, uh, so the railroads definitely played um, a huge part in it. Whether the killer uh, was doing his work uh, on the trains is always going to be debated. It, re it remains mm -hmm. a matter of debate, but it certainly feels plausible. American Demon is the name of the book. Elliot Ness and the Hunt for America's Jack the Ripper. Going back, re-examining this with 21st century eyes and ability to pull information from many different sources. Um, Daniel, do you feel that this gives you a good overview, a good oversight as to what you think really happened, or are you still uh, somewhat left on the fence with how this could take place and who the perpetrators might be? You know, I say in the book that I could argue either side of the equation with respect to uh, Dr. X. For my purposes, the goal was to throw light on this extraordinary work that Elliot Ness did in the back half of his career after mm -hmm. the Untouchables had disbanded. This remarkable work that uh, gets overlooked because what happened in Chicago was so, was so dramatic. Uh, um, with, with the killer, um, you know, it's like Jack the Ripper, uh, like the magic bullet and the grassy knoll. These are crimes that are gonna be uh, debated um, over and over again as long as people are interested in such things for my purposes it was enough that elliot ness had latched onto this guy really believed this was the guy and did everything he could to bring this unpleasant chapter to a close how horrific uh, you know and, and what's really sad my understanding of it from talking to the locals was that not being able to crack this case not being able to bring in his man as he was so proud of, of that kind of character that he had been built into, uh, really sullied his career and his plans for running for political office in and around that area. Do you believe that that did weigh in on the reason for his failure in, in office? I'm sure it was a factor, but mm -hmm. uh, there was more going on there. Ness had uh, uh, served very successfully and with great distinction as director of public safety. Uh, and it's a, a tribute to the, the success he had and the esteem in which he was held um, that he stayed in the position even after the mayor who had appointed him uh, moved on and, and uh, took higher office. Another mayor came in, but he retained Ness because Ness was essential. He was getting, getting the job done. Um, but uh, there came a time when Ness left that position. He, was, he did some work um, for the government during... Um, during World War II, um, again, uh, work with a great deal of distinction. By the time he finally circled back to the idea of running for office in Cleveland, his moment had passed. The political uh, the political winds had uh, shifted, and uh, although he made a uh, he made a great case, he wasn't a natural politician, and he was defeated when he ran for mayor um, pretty soundly. I don't think that really broke his heart terribly much. I think he understood that he wasn't really cut out for politics. 
Uh, and in fact, when people had urged him to run for mayor for the mayor's office earlier, he said, no, nah, I'm going to stick with the job that I that I was appointed to do. Um, there's still plenty of crime that needs to be handled. Well, folks, the book is out and available as of a few weeks ago, American Demon. And we have a link up for that on today's program guide so that you can find it right in my bookshop on Amazon. We've got it there and available to order for yourself. There's audible versions. There's uh, the, the hardcover. There's everything there. So you'll find a way to, to uh, enjoy this book and read it. And for those of you that are into true crime, check this book out. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us and being part of the program today. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Well, this area was not done with the crimes that took place there. There were strange supernatural occurrences that continued to pop up. So strange, in fact, that not only were individuals seeing and having experiences, but so were the police. And that's when Dr. Hans Holzer was called in. We'll talk about that and more when we return to the best in paranormal programming. You're listening and watching The Paranormal 60 with Dave Schrader. Welcome to the Paranormal Couples Haunted Museum of Objects, Oddities, and Curiosities. Curated by the paranormal couple themselves, Cody Ray Despian and Satori Hawes. This unique traveling exhibition visits haunted locations and conventions around the United States and features up to 150 presumed haunted artifacts from the museum. These objects have been hand-selected by Cody and Satori themselves due to their intriguing yet eerie spooky stories. Come view items from around the world, including tribal artifacts, occult items, true crime memorabilia, haunted dolls, clowns, and so much more. If you're a fan of the paranormal or history in general, then there's something here for you. For more information on the museum and upcoming events, be sure to visit us at ParanormalCouple.com and follow us on Facebook at The Paranormal Couples Haunted Museum. Hey, it's Chris Jericho here just reminding you about the Four Leaf Clover. Chris Jericho's rock and wrestling rager at sea, the fourth voyage, leaving February 2nd from Miami to Great Stirrup Key, our very own private island. This is going to be the biggest and best Jericho cruise ever with the biggest lineup, the most fun, I guarantee it. Come join us for the vacation and the party of a lifetime. ChrisJerichoCruise.com. Cabin's still available. I want to see you there. Haunted Magazine, issue 35, is out 6th September, featuring the feminine macabre, vampires, the Gold Camp Road, Jamaica Inn, ESP, Australia's spookiest spectres, Richard Estep investigates Shepton Manor Prison, the Roswell Incident, 75 years on, the burden of Lizzie Borden by Sam Beltrusis, the seminal ghost watch hits 30, plus an in-depth chat with ghost hunter Barry Guy. Order in print from the Haunted Magazine website or visit WH Smith in the UK, Barnes & Noble in the US and outlets in Canada and Australia. It's also available in the app stores. And remember, don't be normal, be paranormal. Hey friends, remember just a few episodes left. In the brand new hit series, Ghosts of Devil's Perch, you can see it on Travel Channel and Discovery+. Plus. And remember, watch those shows within the first 24 to 48 hours to have them count towards the ratings. If you love the show and you want to see us get another season, that's what it's going to take. New episodes every Sunday with just a few left. And tomorrow, we'll be back with a recap of last week's episode and a peek at what you can expect coming up this week on the program. 
right now, though, folks. It's time now for Paratunes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dan Doherty sends us this tune, This Cursed Land. I thought that was a great song apropos to today's show. And we've got an interesting angle to now take you on. As I mentioned just before the break, we were talking about episode one of season two of the Holzer Files. My mind fried for a second there. And uh, we we visited Cleveland following in the footsteps of the serial killer. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with the case, Dr. Hans Holzer was called into this case Because there was more than one witness. This family was being tormented by something in their home, something unseen, this terrifying paranormal presence. And they had a trap door in their kitchen uh, that went down below the house and something was down there. 
Uh, the police eventually were called to it. Uh, other times they'd open it up, there'd be nothing down there. The police came in and they could see this hand reaching up. So visual and visceral of an experience that the police officer drew his gun and emptied rounds into the hand and into the floor. It's all on police record. Dr. Hans Holzer talked to the people involved in this case. And at the time, couldn't put two and two together to what was taking place. He had an idea, but by the time he was able to get to the location, it had already been torn down. It was, again, not one of the more pleasant areas in town and uh, had fallen into disrepair. This story is one of the more creepy and chilling elements of the Holzer Files. And I wanted to invite a couple of friends on. They have something coming up that's uh, pretty exciting. It's going to be taking place here um, on uh, September 24th and 25th at the old B&O Roundhouse, which you saw featured in the Holzer Files episode. They have the paranormal conference that will be taking place. You get access to this location to see the sites that we filmed at at the Holzer Files. They've got a lot of great guests coming on. And uh, they are here with me to spend the last segment of our show together. We've got Teresa Muncy joining us. We also have with us Sabrina Marie. Thank you, ladies, for being here tonight. Well, thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, when we first heard about this case, I'm like, oh, there's something knocking at the floor. The, and then when it comes to the fact that the police show up and see something, empty rounds into the floor and finally open up the door to find there's no blood, there's no hand. There's no person, there's no trail, you know, of, of anybody that would have been shot. That was really compelling to us to, to uncover in the story. And then to kind of be drawn around all of these locations that had uh, murders associated with them. And many of them, as we mentioned in the last segment, falling along the line of the B&O Railroad there. Uh, is, is it still hopping with activity in and around that area that you believe is tied to these murders? Absolutely. Yes, definitely. Uh, we kind of feel that the, the piano is kind of a, a draw in for energy mm -hmm. for all of the things that happen around it. Yeah. Right. And when, when you put a, a location that is that old in the middle of all that crime, it itself is got trains coming in and out constantly, con uh, uh, overturned constantly of people coming in and out. Who knows where they are, who they are, what they're doing. And then you have all this crime that's going around. And then that area was not that great back when the, you know, some of the murders <laughs> were happening back in the torso right. murders. And, you know, when you put all that together and you have all that collective energy in one location, it's going to draw other energy in. So well, I know. You know on, on the series that I'm in now, um, The Ghost of Devil's Perch, in episode four, we talk about the railway and how it runs through parts of this town where there is this energy. And it almost makes you wonder, do the rails, does the energy from these these trains going back and forth, creating energy, creating static, creating uh, you know sparks, does that kind of feed an area, making it kind of a temporal um, energetic feeding port for the supernatural. And I know that sounds very woo woo and out there, but <laughs> it's crazy how much activity takes place around there. We caught some of the most dynamic evidence. I mean, I heard and saw something walking around me. We caught it. I couldn't keep up with where it was moving, but thankfully our static camera caught that fully formed shadow figure walking within about 20 feet of me. And I had no clue where it was. I could see it flutter and be gone. Uh, Shane had that shadow hand that reached out at him, uh, very similar to the experience, uh, although the, the family that had reported it in that episode saw a flesh and blood hand. There was something that reached out of that wall towards Shane when he was down in the pit underneath one of the uh, the train cars. So it was really, uh, you know, compelling activity that still goes on, like I said, nearly 100 years later. And I'm willing to bet that even if the torso killer moved on to another place, maybe Pennsylvania or further on down the line, I'm willing to bet that area was still pretty ripe for crime because it's easy to take advantage of the train system and hop on and off and do horrific things, get back on and leave kind of a blood wake in its trail. 
Yeah. yeah. You put aside the, uh, the whole story of the torso murders. You've got so much other activity that's going on here with yeah. all the people coming in and out. I mean, we've actually heard a story of a young girl that was raped in that area where the B&O is in their warehouse. Mm. And she was murdered there. Uh, we're still investigating that to get a, you know, as you know, there's no 100% anything in the paranormal field, but right. to, um, to get our take on it, there is something there. We're still working on that, but the shadow figure that you saw, we've seen <laughs> mm. when we investigated it, we saw the same shadow. So, and there are other shadows there. Shadows. It makes you wonder, is this thing still stalking its killing grounds? Yeah. Is it still walking amongst the killing field and allowing itself to kind of live in that vibe? That's terrifying to me. There was a scene that did not make the episode because um, we couldn't catch a clear angle of it. But at one point, we saw something walking on top of one of the train cars in the roundhouse, and it seemed to leap from train car to train car, and it was moving on. We were trying to track it but couldn't keep up with it. We heard active footsteps. There was a scene where we were sitting outside of the death car, and I'll have you guys remind everybody what the death car is and the history behind it. Um, and we were sitting out there talking to one of the proprietors there, one of the, the people that helped run this the uh, roundhouse um, for historic purposes. And while we were chatting, you could hear something banging around inside the death car, which was feet from us. And it would it, it seemed to be getting agitated at what we were discussing that was unsettling for all because again i could see we could see from our angle the death car i knew where all of our cast and crew were there was something in that car moving about um can you can you give us a quick story again just so we understand the death car because that's going to be a part of your your conference as well people will get access to go in and see it and and probably investigate it mm -hmm. why is it referred to as the death car well it's nickel plate 62 is the actual name of the car um but it was part of a horrific accident. That Wait, you mean its natural name is not the death car? Because I was thinking <laughs> if they named it that, they were just asking for trouble. No, I like that. So go ahead. <laughs> it was part of a horrific train wreck that happened in 1943, the Lackawanna wreck. Um, it was coming from New Jersey, as you believe, into Cleveland. Mm -hmm. And the train conductor wanted to make up some time. And another train didn't get off the tracks. They ended up hitting. They sideswiped. Mm. Um, steam was released into the death car, boiling all the people inside. They literally breathed in the steam. It boiled their lungs, and they they were steamed to death. Yeah. Brutal. Yeah. Brutal. Uh, it. There was quite a few people that died on that train, and it was a very painful, tragic way to die. I mean, yeah. the, the, the window shattered, glass was flying, you know, people were trying to hide underneath the chairs to try to get away from the steam. Of course, that didn't work. Um, mm. So a lot of people died on that train and, and, you know, innocent people, they were just simply going from one location to another. Well, some of them are still there. Yeah. And we know firsthand. Yeah. We, yeah. We've what, what experiences actually, have you guys had there? Yeah. Uh, we did the Estes method on there, and um, it was it was a wild night. Now, for our listeners, just so you know, the Estes method is um, like you saw in the third episode of the uh, Ghost of Devil's Perch, where I had the noise canceling headphones on. I was blindfolded. It was a slightly different variation. <laughs> for some reason, KD wanted to make me the living Homer Simpson, so I had the <laughs> ping pong balls over my eyes. Um, but that that's so that there's still diffused light and there's mm -hmm. still a sense of something there, not closing off all of my senses, but, you know, trying to help me hone into what was going on. But it was strange because I could see movement, even though there was nothing going on in front of me. Um, so that's kind of the Estes method. Then while this sound is going, you're hearing the of the the box and it's sound canceling. I can't hear outside mm -hmm. KD would ask a series of questions and I would just call out whatever words were coming through the headphones. Mm -hmm. So that's what the Estes method is. I just want people to understand that when we describe it, but go ahead. The things that we were picking up with the, with the Estes method, um, 
the well i'm also medium too and so mm -hmm. i was getting psychic visions the whole time i was feeling like boiling water hitting my skin Yeesh. they would it would be on the back of my head a lot and on my arms on my face and neck and they were repeatedly begging us to leave the train mm -hmm. and what really it it broke my heart when we got to the end we were wondering why are you trying to hurt me but they weren't they were actually trying to protect me it was please don't be next yeah. they no. just wanted us off the train to to prevent that from happening again and i just happened to be sitting in one of the seats that the woman communicating with me had sat in when she died yeah. and her that, husband isn't that crossed. Isn't that too overwhelming to be a medium, a sensitive, and be sitting in the actual seat? It's it's overwhelming. It is, but <clears throat> it's worth it to me because then I can really tell their story. So well, I, I know I put my audience up. audience members are going to want to know as well. How do you how do you differentiate? I mean, you know the area, you know the story, you know the death car pretty well. How do you know that it's not triggering imagination? Our brain loves to fill in stories. Our brain loves to happen. How do you know that you're truly experiencing that moment and having that, and it's not the theater of the mind taking place because you're aware of the tragedy that, that took place in that exact spot? When I went in, I didn't have all the knowledge of mm -hmm. exactly how the, the wreck happened. Um, I knew that steam was released into the car. I thought the windows were just all open because it was a summer day. Um, what I was getting was glass breaking, glass shattering. I had no idea that uh, boiling water actually went into the car too. Mm. And later on, you know, I talked to the the director who we've been working with there and who was on the show, with you, right. and he gave us all the paperwork, all the details of the actual wreck. And all of a sudden I'm getting the name of some of the women that was, that were on there and I'm getting the glass breaking and the water coming in. We're just looking at each other when we read this paper, like, oh my God, that's where it came from. Because it made no sense at the moment. So when you can fill in those little details, even though you have some knowledge, mm -hmm. then then you can really di differentiate that it's not just your mind playing. It's not kind of a psychic pareidolia. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. So that's one of the tragic uh, sites there. And again, it is available during the event. It will be there so people can actually um, be a part of it. Will they be able to ghost hunt on uh, and I ghost hunt? I still hate that word. You're not hunting ghosts. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're seeking connection with the supernatural. You're, yeah. you're paranormal investigating. But will they have access to the death car, not just to look at it from the outside, but to go in and try to make communication? We'll be doing tours during the day of it. Mm -hmm. And on Saturday night, uh, we're part of the world's largest ghost tent too. So it is a ticketed event for Saturday night. Most definitely it's, it's online tickets only, but you will have the opportunity to investigate the death car. We've got a link up for that on tonight's program guide folks. Uh, and again, let them know. I want them to realize this is an important aspect as well. There was some damage done at the BNO roundhouse and uh, you guys are doing this as a charity program to help them uh, and to keep this place restored. Tell us a little bit about what happened. Uh, in the early 2000s, a excavator was bumping into the beams that were in uh, stall six through 10. And that caused the roof to collapse. And when the, the roof is the main support of a roundhouse, mm -hmm. according to the guys there. <laughs> and the wall collapsed and they had to scramble to, just to try to stabilize the building. Since then, they've been working to get funding and donations to build that back up. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing with this is 100% of our ticket proceeds go to them to rebuild this wall and get six through 10 working again. Yeah. That's awesome. Now, the roundhouse is all volunteer. The, the people that work there are volunteers. And when that part of the building was destroyed, it cut down on their production and that's what they have, you know, so they're, they're limited now to mm -hmm. a small area. So they need, to have that open because there's some of the old history trains that are outside in the elements that need to be inside. And, you know, the longer they're outside, the more, you know, they're, they're part of this world where they're going to rot and that's, Rip, that's just more restoration apart, yeah. they have to do to them. So it, it is, it's very important to these people. The, the we're talking, um, you know, the volunteers are all ages. 
-hmm. And we actually had, we actually ran into a 13 year old young man that is volunteering. It's a family. And uh, his take on it is you get to learn some really cool skills here. You get to know the history. You get to, he's an amazing young man and his whole family volunteer there. And That's it's awesome. men, men and women, you know, it doesn't matter where you come from. Um, some of these people are retired engineers. They, this is something they just love to do, you know, and it's where they want to Oh be. yeah. You, you yeah. could sense the passion from everybody yeah. there when we were on site, they wanted us to treat this place with respect, which of course oh, we yeah. always bring, but they, they, and I love that they're all kind of the skeptical believers, right? They're all like, <laughs> yeah. ah, I don't, I can't say it's ghosts, but I can tell you, I yeah. don't want to be here at night by myself. Right. And they, right. they would hear things and lights will go on and go off and they get a lot of crazy activity. Uh, I know our time's slipping away from us quickly here. What's what's one of the weirdest experiences you've had regarding the paranormal in that area? And, and maybe we'll start with you, Teresa. Um, I think one of the worst things is I was actually investigating in the roundhouse and mm -hmm. I took a picture. There was nothing between me and this object. Um, and it was the back of one of the trains that was there. And I got the picture is of a cloaked shadow. Mm. Where it came from, what it is, I have no idea. But it is clear as can be. It, there's no denying it. And I'm kind of a skeptic of my own evidence. You know, mm -hmm. if, I, if I'm a skeptical of it, nobody else can prove me wrong. Right, you know, right. if I say it's real, it's real. So, but um, yeah, that's just from all the years of being you know, part of this, I just, you know, do you feel I'm like there's a darkness over that area still because of the, the violence Honestly, that's taken place? Mm -hmm. That was, that shadow figure was a very, um, it was very dark. It was not, um, you know, I mean, we didn't feel a lot of darkness, like in the, in the train, it was like, they were just trying to help us. They wanted us mm -hmm. off. Um, but in the roundhouse, there is a dark energy. Hmm. And uh, I'm thinking that's part of it. The shadow that I got was part of it. I had no idea why there was a cloaked figure there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're still investigating that. So <laughs> back to investigating. When I, when I was outside at the one point, what, what drew me, you know, I mean, Shane is underneath the one yeah. train cindy's in the death car trying to communicate and i heard a uh, very clearly a woman scream yeah and at first i thought it was cindy it was not uh then i thought oh maybe it's shane <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it was not maybe it was. No. <laughs> but uh that way it was you could definitely feel it was palpable the 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 dark tension yeah. over the location uh, before I get to your story, Sabrina, you are also the author of this great kids book, Little Moons, which I got a copy of while we were at Michigan Paracon and uh, plan on reading to my grandson. So thank you for a copy of that. But um, and we'll have a link up so people can find you and get because you've authored uh, quite a few different books. Yeah. I want to yes, make sure people can find you. Yeah. But let me hear your weirdest, most chilling experience so far from ghost hunting in that area that are tied, you think, maybe to these murders. Oh, well, mine is definitely this, the same as hers. <laughs> I mean, that cloaked figure was terrifying to see on the back of that train, knowing that we're standing right across from it. Um, not, and whether that's involved with the murders or not, I don't know. I would say. Yeah, you yeah. have to wonder because of the, yeah. the psychic scarring there. It Does oh, it have yeah. a tie to the murders or is it mm -hmm. something dark that was drawn there because that those tortured yeah. souls, those sad souls are still in that place and it feeds off of it. It's, it's tragic to consider either way. Um, uh, I personally think yeah. the land itself is a little, um, First. got a lot of negativity there. I yeah. mean, some of those bodies were actually, their blood is in that land. Right. You know? So yeah, when we talk about that as well on the show, yeah. the it's, it's such a tragic place so when you go there folks show respect show love mm -hmm. for the spirits uh even the dark shadowy figures we don't know exactly what it is we're dealing with maybe it's yeah. just all that's left of one of the victims that may have been using a raincoat at the time of its murder don't always jump to the conclusion that it's dark but but be cautious go with that gut instinct and feeling but show respect so that you don't end up having 
spiritual connections as well. Ladies, I wish you a lot of luck with the uh, upcoming paranormal event, uh, the old B&O Paracon that will be taking place September 24th and 25th this coming weekend, and you'll be a part of the world's biggest ghost hunt. Uh, we'll have a link up again on today's show guide so they can find ways to get tickets. Thanks for the work you're doing and bringing that information out. Thank you. Thank for you for having us. Out. <laughs> you Thank got you. it. You got it. All right. That's it. A lot to think about. A lot to consider. Dealing with spirits is it's sometimes difficult enough, but when it comes to those that ended in a most tragic way, it can be even more difficult. I mean, the spirits, they, they want and desire to be remembered for more than just how they died. Got to remember that because that's not what defines them. The stories like the one that we shared today, they, they should never glorify the killer or their actions. They should always be a call to arms to remember the victims as they were in life. Warm, loving humans like you and me with hopes, dreams, and desires that sadly were ripped away from them. But that's not what defines their memory, or at least it shouldn't be. Lift up the name of those victims, share their stories, and let them know they amounted to more than just the horrific way that they died. I'd like to thank my guests today, Daniel Stashauer. You can find a link for his book on today's program guide. Also, thanks to Sabrina Marie. We have a link for her and her books and Teresa Muncie for sharing the stories of the spirits that still walk that area, seeking justice and to be remembered. You can find more information about the upcoming paranormal event at the old B&O Roundhouse in the links included on today's show guide. Thank you all for visiting the Paranormal 60 and allowing me along on your journey. And may the darkness be a little more light with the information that we share here. As long as there are spirits crying out to be heard, we will always be a place to give them voice and help tell their story. Make sure to like this video and the audio podcast. Subscribe, tell everybody you know about it, share these links, and get this thing growing. And for all of our new podcast listeners and viewers, please rate and review the show. Go ahead, give it five stars. You know you want to. And thank you for joining our family here on the Paranormal 60. 